This is Duke University. Good evening. John Hope Franklin at 100, scholar, activist, citizen. Welcome to this event marking the centennial of my father, John Hope Franklin, and also of my mother, Aurelia Whittington Franklin. They met at Fisk University when they were 16-year-old first-year students in the fall of 1931. In 2010, I was in the grocery store line and saw a special issue of Life magazine celebrating Mother Teresa's centennial. I realized my parents' centennial was just five years away. Then I spoke in Wichita on the occasion of Gordon Parks' centennial, and I brought home copies of Wichita State's booklet honoring all aspects of his career. My wife Karen and I then met with President Broadhead and discussed the need to plan my father's centennial. Former Provost Lang convened a centennial planning committee and Professors Thibolia Glimpf and Tommy DeFrance co-chaired the faculty committee planning this symposium. This week's symposium, Global Slaveries, Impossible Freedoms, The Intellectual Legacies of John Hope Franklin, marks the crescendo of a year rich in programs, exhibits, films, and lectures at Duke, North Carolina Central University, St. Augustine's, and the Durham Public Libraries. The John Hope Franklin Young Scholars publish their graphic novel based on young people inspired by the life of John Hope Franklin. Last week's remarkable concert featured the world premiere of Sometimes, as in Sometimes I Feel Like a Motherless Child, composed by Frederick Reshevsky and played by the Imani Winds. The concert included performances by the Fist Jubilee singers, both alone and with the Imani Winds. In addition to the Centennial Planning Committees, Karen and I would particularly like to thank the sponsors of this symposium, President Broadhead, Bill Chafe and Richard Riddell, John Gartrell, Natasha Eves, and Camille Jackson. Please join me in welcoming Professor Tommy DeFrance, co-chair of the Symposium Planning Committee. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, John W. Um, welcome. Good evening, I'm Thomas F. DeFrance, the Chair of African and African American Studies here at Duke. I hold a joint appointment also in dance. My task is a simple one. I am to welcome you to the Centenary Symposium. There then, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> On behalf of the planning committee, the many supporters and funders of the event, and especially the, the Department of African and African American Studies here at Duke. We are enlivened by your presence and appreciative of your strong efforts to join us in this unique event. John W.'s comments about his father compel my memory of my own father. He wasn't a famous man, and he certainly never met presidents or traveled widely, but he was a community activist in our home of Indianapolis, Indiana. For much of his career, my father worked at the Community Action Against Poverty, which was a Nixon-era social service organization formed in large part to contradict the very positive impact that the Black Panthers had at that time, providing healthcare strategies for black communities across the country. Community Action Against Poverty was a government program designed to fail, but my father surely did more than his share to keep it going in its time. My father's legacy to me, I think, propels from a simple idea that resonates with my understanding of how we might mobilize our impressions of Professor Franklin's work. It's something like this. If we are to achieve growth together, we're going to have to find ways to work together that acknowledge our differences and encourage our curiosities. And then we have to do the work. <laughs> 
I've enjoyed bending my elbows alongside Tavolia Glimp, Associate Professor of History and African African American Studies here at Duke, and currently the John Hope Franklin Visiting Professor of, of American History. She's the co-chair of this grand event, and I'd like to invite Tavolia up so we can do something now. Where is she, Tavolia? Thank you. While she's coming, a word about our title, a short word, Tavoli and I began arranging the symposium over a year ago, and yet months later, after all of the pre presenters had agreed to participate, we still had no gathering notion to refer to. We reached back to Imagine Forward and brought Professor Franklin's titular exhortation into a saddened 21st century circumstance. When I shared the title of our symposium to our AAAS faculty colleagues, and again, the title is Global Slaveries, Impossible Freedoms, I was met with side eyes and silences. After an awkward pause, an Africanist in the room asked, where's the hope in that? <laughs> well, that's why we gather, of course, for the hope, a prescient middle name borne by Professor Franklin and surely implicit in our gathering. So now we need to perform a second task, which is a thank you, and we need um, Natasha Eves and Camille Jackson to come forward. Are you here, Natasha, Camille? Uh, as John W. mentioned, these are the two amazing people who have really made this event happen, have done all the logistics and publicity, and we certainly could have moved any of this forward without you. So we thank you very heartily, and we have for you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, welcomes are done, let's begin. I have a second task that neither of my parents might have imagined for their son, who is a dancer, to introduce the president of Duke University. <laughs> As the ninth president of Duke and the William Preston Few Professor of English, Richard Broadhead is a scholar of 19th century American literature and a national leader in higher education. Since arriving at Duke in 2004, he has enriched undergraduate education, working to unify Duke's academic opportunities within the undergraduate residential experience he also led the expansion of Duke's financial aid endowment to ensure that admitted students can afford to attend regardless of their financial circumstances. Under his leadership, Duke established the Duke Global Health Institute and launched the signature program, Duke Engage, which gives Duke undergraduates the opportunity to apply their classroom knowledge in service to society, in other words, to do the work. Broadhead has made globalization a major strategic pr uh, priority for the university with the creation of Duke NUS Graduate Medical School Singapore and Duke Kunshin University. Please welcome pre uh, President Duke Broadhead. No orchid for me. <laughs> I will remember this Professor de France shading my gratitude for your introduction. Uh, only to say, this, this is a great day, but it is a great day partly because it ends an extraordinarily memorable year. Many of us in this room have been at a series of events going back to the MLK Day event in January that launched uh, the year-long observation of the centennial of John Hope Franklin. And since then, indeed, we have gone to concerts, we have gone to films, we've done lots of things, but I admire the idea that we save for the last the thing that would have been very much, very closest of all the things close to the hearts of John Hope Franklin, this is a, a couple of days symposium in which we will look at evolved versions of his great subjects, enslavement and emancipation, uh, and look at them through the lens of his particular craft, his particular vocation, the vocation of history. I find it, you know, uh, I never tire of uh, considering the details of the life of this person who became my colleague when I came here uh, and my friend. Uh, how he went to Fisk University in the 30s, as we hear. Uh, but the part I always find so striking is he was destined, being a young man of talent who wasn't destined for medicine, uh, he must be, have been de destined for law. Uh, but of course, when he got to college, he, something happened to him that made him find another destiny for himself. Uh, he found the field of history. He had a professor named Ted Courier. He took every class this person taught. 
Uh, and of course, if I tell you that Ted Currier had begun, though not finished, graduate education at Harvard, you can see that the good teacher exerted his effect not only by making a person feel a life calling to history, but by making him follow a life course to the very graduate school his teacher had gone to. And what remains to me the single most amazing detail of this all, uh, his professor, so let's remember, this is the dead center of the Depression. His, depressor, his professor put up $500 of personal money to enable John Hope Franklin to go to graduate school. He repaid it, but no one can repay a gift like that because that's, uh, I mean, to, if we speak of teaching as the investment in the future of our students, I don't think we can think of a more literal example to it uh, than that. So all of a sudden, you're at Harvard, and all of a sudden, you have Arthur Schlesinger working with you and all kinds of people like that, and all of a sudden, you've written a dissertation, uh, but, and you've discovered an interest in the history of North Carolina. Don't, rem don't forget, he was not from North Carolina. He discovered it historically. He discovered the state and eventually his home through the vocation of history, came here, uh, of course, as we all know and have many times reminded ourselves, got the available jobs, thus at segregated colleges, St. Augs and North Carolina College for Negroes, the current central. But there he did the historical work, first the book, uh, uh, The Free Negro in North Carolina, a work of Im immense interest and full of surprises. Uh, and then the, this, the famous story that his wife funded a sabbatical. She was his domestic Guggenheim, we might say. Uh, <laughs> the ACLS I love, uh, who she worked to give him a year off so he could write the book that would be his gift through the vocation of history to the world that was awaiting it, the book from slavery to freedom. And I suppose one of the things that makes me proud, the president's office at Duke, when you walk out the door of it, you look at the library, uh, and the library at Duke is not the only place, but it is one of the places that the archival research was done that enabled the writing of the book From Slavery to Freedom, with everything it did to uh, create the, the recognition in America that American history is African American history too, and African American history is American history too, that there's, they're not separate sto and parallel stories, they are the same same story uh, or aspects of the same story. Uh, now don't forget, he couldn't be on the faculty at Duke because we were segregated, but he could work in the library of Duke, apparently because you can do things in libraries that you can't do in other spaces. <laughs> uh, the fact that later on, when he came to retire, he chose to come back to Durham as his home uh, suggests that he had uh, uh, roots and memories and affiliations here. How to honor the life of this particular person? Uh, I think, uh, the, as I say, the symposium seems to me the best way. The practitioners of his craft, the people who extend his life's work into uh, the work, the, the, the life of our time. Uh, and what a privilege for us to have the person introduce this symposium be, uh, 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 I'm going to repeat the stumbling I heard in you, Tommy, Professor, oh, I mean President Drew Faust. Uh, <laughs> We're very happy to have the president of Harvard with us. Harvard is a well-known school. Uh, it is, uh, 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 it is certainly many people have heard of the place where you uh, work, uh, but I think every more than that, people know you could list Drew's accomplishments as the president of Harvard, but everyone I know at Harvard says the same thing about her accomplishment, that she restored a sense of community to a place that was famous for many things, but not particularly for that. Uh, and so it seems to me that's an amazing achievement, and I have worked alongside you as a spokesperson uh, for an enlightened vision of education at a time of change, but a time where change threatens to make people leave all kinds of interesting things uh, unattended to. Uh, nevertheless, our particular pleasure in having you here is to have you here because you are the president as historian or the historian as president, uh, that the basis of your holding the title you now do is your life as a scholar and the fact that you had the same thing happen to you at some point that happened to John Hope Franklin in the classrooms of Ted Courier, which is all of a sudden this thing was so fascinating that you had to spend the rest of your life doing it. Uh, and those of us uh, who know about your fame at Harvard uh, probably uh, people in this room most know that we have read the books like The Mothers of Invention, we have read the books like This Republic of Suffering, books in which you went into the archives, you found those musty papers that enabled, that are the mark of people's experience uh, and were able to feel your way back into their lives and thus restore our knowledge of what new powers came to women when men left in the Civil War. Uh, how did it happen that women honored by their functionlessness 
in a, li in a leisured society uh, were able to find their function, functionality uh, uh, at a, uh, uh, in the emergency of the war uh, or uh, 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 in the other uh, great, st great story of your telling. How did it, ha what did it mean for so, when that war started, no one knew that what 700,000 people would, would, would die, an immense fraction of the, pe of the people in this country. What did that actually mean in the experience of people and what did they tell themselves it meant? I would say, uh, it, you know, uh, uh, I assume that John Hope Franklin is in heaven, uh, if only the heaven of scholars. Uh, but you know, who maybe he, maybe they're the same thing. Uh, and uh, if he's looking down, I imagine he will take particular pleasure in the fact that Drew Faust is the person here to in inaugurate this symposium. It is said, you know, somebody once told me all cliches are true, uh, and if you live long enough, you can come to suspect that that might be true, although a cliche. Uh, <laughs> And the one that came to my mind as I was thinking of Drew is, it takes one to know one. Uh, you, you, you will be able to help us know John Franklin, uh, John Hope Franklin, because you are the practitioner of what he most fundamentally was, a historian. Uh, you will know him, and he knows you to be the very thing he most admired, Drew Faust. Thank you, Dick. I love being introduced as a historian, and I feel so grateful for the invitation tonight that has enabled me to think about history these past months as I've thought about what I wanted to say to you today. John Hope Franklin did me the enormous honor of speaking at my presidential inauguration in 2007, and it just meant the world to me that he would come back to Harvard about what, which he was quite ambivalent to say the least, um, and speak at that moment and speak for history. And I am just delighted to be able to, hear, to be here tonight and say some words about him. John Hope Franklin, as we all know, wrote history, discovering neglected and forgotten dimensions of the past, mining archives with creativity and care, building in the course of his career a changed narrative of the American experience and the meaning of race within it. But John Hope Franklin also meditated about history and its place in the world on its role as action as well as description, on history itself as causal agent, and on the writing of history as mission as well as profession. I've thought of John Hope often in recent months as we've seen a conservative Republican governor call for the removal of the Confederate flag from the South Carolina State House grounds, as the Democratic Party has renamed the Jefferson Jackson Day Dinner in order to distance itself from two slave-owning forebears, as Yale University debates removing the name Calhoun from one of its undergraduate colleges. Many Americans in 2015 seem to be undertaking an unprecedentedly clear-eyed look at the nation's past, at the legacy of slavery and race that have made us anything but a colorblind society. There could be no more fitting tribute to Franklin's 100th birthday than this collective stock-taking for no one has done more to delineate the contours of that shameful legacy and to insist upon its importance to America's presence and future. And in that effort, he's also done something more for history itself, insisting not just upon its relevance, but indeed its preeminence as the indispensable instrument of change and even salvation from legacies that left unexamined will destroy us. Good history, he remarked in 2003, is a good foundation for a better present and future. Franklin's childhood in segregated Oklahoma introduced him to racism's cruelties at an early age. He was just six when he and his mother were ejected from a train for sitting in a white-only car. His father was so embittered by his treatment as a black lawyer that he moved his family to an all-black town after resolving 
to, as he put it, resign from the world dominated by white people. Yet Franklin's parents insisted he was the equal of any other human being. And his mother repeatedly urged him to tell anyone who asked him about his aspiration that he intended to be the first Negro president of the United States. If you believe in yourself, his mother urged, you won't be crying, you'll be defying. Defying, not crying. That captures John Hope Franklin's life. And it captures the history he wrote a history that, in his words, would attempt to rehabilitate a whole people and serve them as a weapon of collective defiance. Inspired by a brilliant teacher at Fisk, Franklin came to see how, as he put it, historical traditions have controlled attitudes and conduct, and how changing history, how challenging the hallowed past, was a necessary condition for changing the present and future. In important ways, the study of history was for Franklin not a choice. It was an imperative. The true scholar, he wrote in 1963, must pursue truth in his field. He must, as it were, apply his trade. If one tried to escape, he would be haunted. He would be satisfied in no other pursuit. History, in the many meanings of the term, chose him. But Franklin wrote, the Negro scholar should not imagine that he could disappear into an ivory tower. The choice to turn his back on the world was not available. From Jonathan Edwards to Thomas Jefferson to Ralph Waldo Emerson to John Kenneth Galbraith, Franklin observed, the American scholar had been drawn into the practical and into policy. The black scholar must fully embrace this tradition of American intellectual life. I now assert, Franklin proclaimed, that the proper choice for the American Negro scholar is to use his history and ingenuity, his resources and talents, to combat the forces that isolate him and his people, and like the true patriot that he is, to contribute to the solution of the problems that all Americans face in common. For John Hope Franklin, history was a calling and a weapon, a passion and a project. Fundamental to the task at hand would be to revise those hallowed falsehoods, to illustrate how the abuse and misuse of history served to legitimate systems of oppression, not just in the past, but in the present as well. Misrepresentations of the past, Franklin came to recognize, had given the white South the intellectual justification for its determination not to yield on many important points, especially in its treatment of the Negro. The post-Civil War South had endeavored to win with the pen what they had failed to win with the sword. Franklin detailed the way the antebellum South rewrote the history of the American Revolution to legitimate increasing commitment to slavery. He detailed how the popular history represented by the 1915 film Birth of a Nation worked to justify the early 20th century revival of the Klan. He detailed how, in a volume commissioned for a prominent series on Southern history, respected historian Merton Coulter's racist assumptions, produced a distorted view of Reconstruction that made an implicit argument against the extension of civil rights in the years immediately following World War II. But Franklin didn't simply critique and revise. He didn't just overturn existing interpretations by bringing a different lens to bear, or even by just grounding the narrative of the past in what were quite revolutionary assumptions of common human capacity and human dignity. Franklin, the scholar, unearthed reams of new facts, facts no one had bothered to look for previously, facts buried in archives, newspapers, government records, facts no historian searched for until history decided that black lives mattered. 
Franklin's approach to the doing of history is perhaps most faithfully and explicitly chronicled in the introduction to his biography of 19th century African-American historian George Washington Williams. A pioneer in charting the black experience, Williams, who died in 1891, had been all but forgotten until Franklin began, in his words, to stalk him. Franklin recounts the story of how over three decades he traveled to countless offices, libraries, and archives on three continents. He pursued clues and leads with Im uh, imagination and with unquenchable curiosity until he was able to piece together a full portrait of the man and his work. History and John Hope Franklin rescued Williams from oblivion to install him in his rightful place as a path-breaking black intellectual, a precursor to Franklin in himself in creating a true history of the nation's past and the place of African Americans within it. The kind of exhaustive research Franklin undertook and described to us for this biography underpinned all his efforts to expand the scope of American history. He discovered the ironies and contradictions of American unfreedom in the lives of free Negroes in the antebellum South, in antebellum North Carolina, in fact. He demonstrated how the pervasive presence of violence shaped and controlled every aspect of white as well as black lives in Southern slave society. He illustrated the hunger for liberation in the records of runaways determined to free themselves and in From Slavery to Freedom, he sought to create an overarching American and global narrative to explain it all. Even John Hope Franklin, who had personally felt the brunt of segregation, who had understood the terrors of racial violence and oppression, even he was sobered by what he found. Writing From Slavery to Freedom, piecing together an account of 500 years of black history brought tales of horror before his eyes. I had seen one slave ship after another pile black human cargo into its bowels. I had seen them dump my ancestors at New World ports as they would a load of cattle and wait smugly for their pay. I had seen them beat black men and rape black women until their ecstasy was spent, leaving their brutish savagery exposed. I had heard them shout, give us liberty or give us death, and not mean one word of it. I had seen them lynch black men and distribute their ears, fingers, and other parts as souvenirs. I had seen it all, and in the seeing, I had become bewildered and lost my innocence. The past and present of racial oppression in America angered John Hope Franklin. His own treatment in graduate school, in the profession, in humiliating incidents that occurred till the very last years of his life, provoked him to express his outrage in autobiographical writings and in what he called literary efforts that he refrained from publishing. He was scrupulous and insistent that such emotions and any of what he called polemics or diatribes should not, in his word, pollute his scholarly work. Yet, he acknowledged, the task of remaining calm and objective is indeed a formidable one. Franklin reserved a particularly vehement resentment for any effort to co-opt or distort his own historical work, to undermine its truths in support of a particular agenda. What he came to regard as one of the worst of such incidents occurred in the early 1960s when the US Commission on Civil Rights invited him to write a history of civil rights since the nation's founding to be completed in time for the centennial of the Emancipation Proclamation in 1963. When Franklin delivered the manuscript, however, it was greeted with disappointment 
by commission members who had anticipated, as they said, a note of greater tolerance and moderation. <laughs> Franklin reminded the commission that the history of blacks in the United States was not a pretty picture, and he continued, I am afraid that I cannot tidy up the history that Americans themselves have made. Forty years later, Franklin still deplored the commission's, and here's how he put it, blatant and crude use of me in its effort to present a false picture of Negro progress. Just as bad, it was also a blatant and crude use of history. The truth that was at once scholarship's product and purpose must not be undermined. The black scholar, Franklin wrote, must understand the difference between hard-hitting advocacy on the one hand and the highest standards of scholarship on the other. This commitment embraced both idealism and instrumentalism. I am struck as I reread John Hope's meditations on history by his sense of vocation, by the awe with which he regarded the role of scholar, by the almost sacred language with which he spoke of what I fear today now is more often regarded as just another job or profession. For John Hope Franklin, it was a transcendent calling one that in the logic of his era and origins should have been unattainable for him, but one he not only achieved, but graced and enhanced in defiance of all expectation. Franklin recognized an irony in this. The Negro scholar, he said, must pursue truth while at the same time making certain that his conclusions are sanctioned by universal standards developed and maintained by those who frequently do not even recognize him. And here lies the instrumentalism. The revisionist history Franklin sought would be unassailable, would overtake past interpretations and exert its force in changing the world because it would, within the clearly articulated standards of the prevailing historical enterprise, be more exhaustively researched, more powerfully argued. A kind of quintessential use of the master's tools to take down the master's house. John Hope Franklin had a deep and inextinguishable faith in the power of an accurate and just history to change the world. It was, as he put it, armed with the tools of scholarship that he did battle against laws, superstitions, prejudices designed to destroy humane dignity and even his capacities, he said, for survival. Yet the historian did not need to be entirely confined to the realm of pure scholarship. The tools of history could also, though separately, be deployed in policy work where past realities could illuminate pressing contemporary dilemmas. Perhaps the most meaningful of such engagements for Franklin was his work with Thurgood Marshall and the team of lawyers and advisors building the case against school segregation for Brown v. Board. The legislative history of the 14th Amendment would be a key element in the case. This was an instance Franklin proclaimed with some pride of historians to the rescue. In this circumstance, he deemed it appropriate to present his findings like a lawyer's brief, rather than, he said, aspiring to be more objective and dispassionate in a stance of the disinterested scholar. Ultimately, Franklin concluded as he looked back, I could not have avoided being a social activist even if I had wanted to. But the tensions between this activism and his scholarly ideals compelled him throughout his long life to self-consciously negotiate the treacherous shoals between advocacy and objectivity. He observed in his autobiography, while I set out to advance my professional career on the basis of the highest standards of scholarship, I also used that scholarship 
to expose the hypocrisy underlying so much of American social and race relations. It never ceased, he said, being a risky feat of tightrope walking. In 1980, he delivered an address to mark his departure from the University of Chicago, where he had taught for 16 years, what proved to be, as you all know very well, only his first retirement, for he joined the Duke, Duke faculty and taught here for a decade. Franklin announced an explicit shift in this talk in his perspective in relation to the past. With now unimpeachable credentials as a highly distinguished historian, with a large and influential oeuvre of historical writing, and as the recipient of almost every imaginable honor, he perhaps felt the burden of establishing legitimacy partially lifted. He had earned the right and the freedom to speak his mind. Up to this point in his career, he said, he had regarded himself as among the faithful disciples of Cleo, concerned exclusively, or at least primarily, with the past. He had for four decades, he said, left it to, I love this list, sociologists, political scientists, and soothsayers to chart a course for the future. <laughs> but now, as he was leaving his formal teaching responsibilities at Chicago, he said, I propose to shift my focus and to dare to think of Cleo's having a vision for the future. Now in actuality, John Hope Franklin can hardly be said to have abandoned his accustomed rigorous historical research during the remaining 29 years of his life. And nor had he been entirely silent about the future in his first 65 years. His evolution would perhaps better be described as an expansion of focus rather than a shift. But as the 20th century approached its end, Franklin began to envision the century to come and to anticipate the persistence of race and its legacy into a new time. In April 1992, when John Hope Franklin was in the air en route to the University of Missouri to deliver a series of endowed lectures, a California jury announced the acquittal of the Los Angeles police officers who had beaten Rodney King. By the time Franklin reached the St. Louis airport, LA had erupted in riots that ultimately killed 53 people before the California National Guard was summoned to quell the violence. For Franklin, these events seemed a tragic affirmation of the argument at the core of his already prepared Missouri lectures. Racism, which he called the most tragic and persistent social problem in the nation's history, had not been eliminated, even with the notable progress made during the Civil Rights Movement. As W.E.B. Du Bois had proclaimed the problem of the 20th century to be, and I quote Du Bois, the problem of the color line, the relation of the darker to lighter races of men in Asia and Africa, in America and the islands of the sea. So now, Franklin cast his eyes forward to declare it the fundamental challenge for the 21st century. I venture to state categorically, he proclaimed, that the problem of the 21st century will be the problem of the color line. And again, or still, he worried about willful distortions of history this time including more recent emerging histories that threaten to undermine the nation's capacity to confront and eliminate racial injustice. The myth of a colorblind society, often erected upon a cynical celebration of the achievements of civil rights legislation and the Voting Rights Act, was being developed in the 1980s and 90s. Franklin believed to end the struggle for racial equality by pro proclaiming it already achieved was a travesty. A colorblind society does not exist in the United States, he stated emphatically to his Missouri audience, and never has existed. But to advance the myth, Franklin asserted, was not simply a delusion. It was a far more pernicious act of bad faith. 
Those who insist we should conduct ourselves as if such a utopian state already existed have no interest in achieving it and indeed would be horrified if we even approached it. Brown had, in Franklin's words, been no magic wand. Litigation, legislation, and executive implementation, however effective some of it was, did not wipe away three centuries of slavery, degradation, segregation, and discrimination. Color, he said, remained a major consideration in virtually everything Americans thought, said, or did. Rodney King's beating was a clear testimony to the persisting force of race. Today, more than 20 years later, Franklin could deliver the same message. We are neither colorblind nor post-racial. John Hope Franklin would have been deeply saddened, but I doubt he would have been surprised by Ferguson, Staten Island, Charleston, Cleveland, Baltimore. He would have been equally saddened and one guesses angered by the recent evisceration of the Voting Rights Act and by the threat the return of the Fisher case to the Supreme Court poses to diversity in higher education. In the last months of his life, Franklin was buoyed by the election of Barack Obama, which he declared amazing. I didn't think it would happen in my lifetime. He dared hope that the nation had turned a significant corner but he knew that erasing the color line required far more than electing a black president. Until we had a new history, we could not build a different and better future. The fundamental requirement, what he said we need to do as a nation and as individual members of society is to confront our past and see it for what it is. It is a past that is filled with some of the ugliest possible examples of racial brutality and degradation in human history. We need to see it, we need to recognize it and not explain it away, excuse it, or justify it. In other words, it is history that has the capacity to save us. Historians to the rescue. Dare we think that the recent rejection of Confederate symbols, challenges to slave owners' reputations and legacy, might be the opening for such a revisionist and clarifying if effort. How can we lodge the truth of history in national discourse and public policy? In an editorial on September 4th of this year, the New York Times underscored how a full understanding of history must be at the heart of any resolution of America's racial dilemma. In words that come close to echoing Franklin's within the context of a different yet all too familiar crisis, the Times wrote of what it called the truth of Black Lives Matter, a truth rooted in the legacies of the past. The Times noted, demonstrators who chant the phrase are making the same declaration that voting rights and civil rights activists made a half century ago. They are not asserting that black lives are more precious than white lives. They are underlining an indisputable fact that the lives of black citizens in this country historically have not mattered and have been discounted and devalued. People the editorial continued, who are unacquainted with this history are understandably uncomfortable with the language of the movement. Only if we understand and acknowledge this past can we grapple with the conflicts of the present and the promise of the future. To confront our past and see it for what it is. Franklin's words, the past is, not the past was. The past lives on, never dead, never even past, to invoke William Faulkner's so frequently quoted phrase. What would it mean to confront it, to see it clearly? Recent history can give us some examples of nations that have taken on the burden of their history. Germany and its Nazi past, South Africa and apartheid. The principle, and in South Africa, an explicit policy and practice was that of truth and reconciliation, 
a recognition that only a collective investigation and acknowledgement of past wrongs can exorcise them and liberate a nation and a people for a better future. History must move beyond the academy, must become a recognized part of everyday life and understanding for all those who would themselves be free from its weight. Recently, two powerful new advocates have taken up Franklin's call for history to come to America's rescue. Echoing many of his observations and insights for a new time and across new and different media. These two 21st century black intellectuals are located outside the formal precincts of the academy. Yet they speak explicitly about why historical scholarship and understanding must play a central role in addressing the tragedies of race in American life. They offer us new, yet in many senses familiar ways of approaching a moment when it seems possible that both history and policy might change. Nearly a half century younger than Franklin, Brian Stevenson, who grew up in segregated Southern Delaware, remembers saving his money for a first youthful book purchase from slavery to freedom. Stevenson's life and work reflect the historical sensibility that characterized Franklin's understanding of the American present. In a TED talk that's been viewed more than two and a half million times, in a best-selling book, and in a life dedicated to the pursuit of equal justice, Brian Stevenson has joined in summoning history to the rescue. Before the Civil War, we as a nation created a narrative of racial difference to legitimize slavery, he explains, and we convinced ourselves of its truth. As a result, instead of genuinely ending slavery, we helped it to evolve into a succession of new forms of unfreedom, culminating in today's mass incarceration. Burdened by a past of racism and cruelty, we don't like to talk about our history, he observes. We have been unwilling to commit ourselves to a necessary process of truth and reconciliation. So we've not succeeded in transcending our past, in confronting and abandoning its assumptions and inequities. We have been too celebratory, he says, about the civil rights movement. We've congratulated ourselves too quickly that the ugliness of racism was eliminated when it has continued to infuse our institutions and our attitudes. Stevenson's day job is directing the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama, suing to stay executions of innocent prisoners, persuading the Supreme Court that children should not be tried as adults and sentenced to death or life imprisonment. But Brian Stevenson has made himself something of a historian as well. The EJI, Equal Justice Initiative, recently issued a detailed report on the slave trade in 19th century Montgomery, part of a project that its website describes as focused on developing a more informed understanding of America's racial history and how it relates to contemporary challenges. The EJI, it proclaims, believes that reconciliation with our nation's difficult past cannot be achieved without truthfully confronting history and finding a way forward. EJI joined with the Alabama Historical Commission to sponsor historical markers in downtown Montgomery, memorializing the vibrant domestic slave trade in which the city played such a prominent part. And now Stevenson has embarked on a new project to erect markers at the sites of the thousands of lynchings that terrorized blacks in the post-Civil War, post-emancipation South. Confederate flags disappearing, memorials to the slave trade emerging, Hollywood producing and even honoring the searing tale of 12 years a slave. History to the rescue, a history that has moved beyond the bounds of the academy, a history erected on the painstaking and rigorous work of John Hope Franklin and the many other scholars who have shared his ideals and purposes. A history being taken up in just the way Franklin would have intended, as foundation for a better present and future. A history that demonstrates the necessity of affirming Black Lives Matter, 
because the heritage of the many centuries that they did not burdens us still. ta Coates, a generation younger than Brian Stevenson, was born six decades after John Hope Franklin. Martin Luther King was seven years dead. Much of the hope of the civil rights movement had evaporated. Racism, bitterness, and a combination of militancy and despair prevailed. Coates' father, a former member of the Black Panther Party, was an initially self-taught intellectual who became an archivist of black history and created a press to share the record of those of African descent from ancient Egypt to Marcus Garvey to Attica. Paul Coates grounded his son, ta says, in history and struggle. Lessons that would make Franklin's work seem a bit old-fashioned, conciliatory, perhaps even compromising. It was Malcolm who became ta hero. I loved Malcolm because Malcolm never lied. He was unconcerned with making the people who believed they were white comfortable in their belief. <laughs> Coates resisted white tools or rules, and he would flee the academy, dropping out of Howard, Mecca, without completing a degree. But he, too, embraced history. My reclamation, he wrote, would be accomplished like Malcolm's through books, through my own study and exploration. Perhaps he mused, I might write something of consequence someday. It would seem he has done just that. And on the second page of his compelling recent meditation on race between the world and me, he proclaims, the answer is American history. His own deep immersion in the past. I have morphed into a Civil War buff, he confesses. This immersion served as epiphany and impetus. I could not have understood 20th century discrimination without understanding its 19th century manifestations. Searching for deeper understanding of the forces underlying the realities of black oppression that he already knew so acutely, Coates turned to scholarship and the traditions of African American history that John Hope Franklin had done so much to build. Coates' history reading list, which you can find posted on the web, rivals a bibliography for PhD orals. He has mastered the academic literature, and from it he has come to understand how slavery was not ancillary to American history, but foundational. How it remains, as he put it, a ghost all over American policy today as Coates has demonstrated in his call for reparations to counter the enormous inequities of race reinforced by modern federal housing and zoning legislation. In Coates's view, whites have been urged away from their real history by myths that have hidden the violence and injustice at its core. America must reject Civil War narratives that have obscured the war's origins in slavery that have permitted unexamined celebrations of Confederate gallantry, and that have, as he puts it, turned the mass slaughter of the war into a kind of sport in which one could conclude that both sides conducted their affairs with courage, honor, and élan. The lie of the Civil War, he explains, is the lie of innocence. It is a dream, a myth, that has lulled and blinded white Americans as it denied and evaded so much of its past. White Americans, he says, have forgotten the scale of the theft that enriched them in slavery, the terror that allowed them for a century to pilfer the vote, the segregationist policy that gave them their suburbs. It is the denial of this history that sustains an emollient innocence and makes the injustices of the present possible. As John Hope Franklin learned when he undertook the research that he fashioned into From Slavery to Freedom, an understanding of history destroys innocence. And the brutal and undeniable truths of murders captured and shared on social media challenge our national presumptions of innocence as well. Can this unavoidable confrontation with the realities of our present 
Open us in new ways to the meaning of our troubling past. Can history help relieve us once and for all of the burdens of that ignorance and the evil it can produce? Are we as historians committed and prepared to seize this opportunity and responsibility to extend history beyond the academy? Are we as a nation at last ready to welcome the truth that can yield reconciliation? Are we as a nation prepared at last to call history to the rescue? If so, it is in no small part because of the kind of history John Hope Franklin dared to write and the ideals he represented as he walked the tightrope between engagement and objectivity, as he struggled to unite history with policy and meaningful change, as he sought truths to save us all. Black lives matter, history matters. John Hope Franklin showed us how much they matter to each other. Thank you.